What do you say to the person that says they struggle with the idea? They, they, they don't have an issue with microevolution, but macroevolution. None of the Christians said they physically resurrected. Yeah. They only said this about Jesus. So only the Christian movement said only Jesus resurrected. If you don't hold to the word inerrancy or infallible, how would you describe the scripture? Let, let, let's talk about evolution here for a second, because people don't understand what it is, mm -hmm. unfortunately. People think evolution is Bruce Lawn. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, an incredible guest today. He has participated in over 30 debates. He has his master's in philosophy, and he's arguably one of the smartest people I've had on the channel. Okay, without any further ado, we have Michael Jones from Inspiring Philosophy. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. We had a great time on the stream yesterday, uh, the, our daily after-party stream. And so I wanted to kind of jump into more of your story and how you ended up getting into philosophy, how you ended up getting into apologetics, how you ended up getting into YouTube. Your channel's over 280,000 subscribers. And so take me back to the, to the beginning, man. Yeah, so I started in 2011, back when YouTube was young and innocent. I'm talking about diapers. I want to go back to diapers. Oh, that Where far. Where are you from? I'm from Pittsburgh, PA. All right. Oh, the only state that calls itself by the initials. That's how you know. Uh -huh. you meet someone from PA. They'll say it's PA, not Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, mom and dad Christian? Yeah, raised Christian. Okay. It was in a very fundamentalist-like church, mm. very young earth creationist, pre-trib, get ready for the rapture kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it just disillusioned me at a young age. I got picked on it at the church. Mm. I once got a concussion at the church from being thrown down steps. Really? Yeah. Why? Because I was small and scrawny and easy to throw. And this happened like in youth group or? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, it was fun. No, it wasn't. Uh, so that happened. And so I it made it put a bad taste in my mouth yeah, for it. Yeah, I bet. But at the same time, I, I was really into books and learning. I liked to read about Egyptian, Greek mythology, uh -huh. the past. And so I had some atheist friends in high school, and they started encouraging me to study evidence against Christianity. Uh, so I tried looking at some of the stuff they gave me, and it was just awful. Mm. Like this crap, like, you know, Jesus was based off Horus mm -hmm. or Dionysus or Mithra, you name it, stuff like that. And I knew from my own research this was crap. Mm -hmm. So I got a little frustrated with it, and I didn't, as luck would have it, I think maybe I just I ended up finding the worst arguments I could find against Christianity. But it made me want to study the evidence for Christianity. Hmm. Uh, so I started in high school, and when I got out of high school, looking into certain things, and I eventually slowly but surely came back to Christianity. It was mm -hmm. a long process. I didn't have a specific moment I can cite, but that's yeah. what happened. Yeah, for me, I grew up Armenian apostolic, didn't really like it, had some bad experiences as well. And then 11, 12 was like, I am an atheist, but what brought what we, reeled me in and really solidified my faith is uh, the new evidence that demands a verdict by Josh McDowell. Mm -hmm. So that was like the first piece of like apologetics that I had read, I think my sophomore year of high school. And it was really good. And then it was Case for Christ and all the other stuff. Did you end up reading some of the same literature or did you go more like academic scholarly stuff? No, I did read Josh McDowell early on. I mm -hmm. read uh, another uh, apologist named J.P. Holding. I read C.S. Lewis, of course. Uh, and then I just, uh, at early age internet, I was getting on message boards and reading debates between mm -hmm. Christians and non-Christians, yep. trying to get some stuff there as well. So that's kind of how I, I kind of came back into it. It was just that yeah. kind of thing. And then I started reading more academic stuff. Got it. And so you would say you were, gave your life to Jesus, walking with Jesus, high school, end of high school-ish? Mm, probably a little, maybe, and towards the end, I mean, I, I didn't have an exact moment, but yeah. it was somewhere in there. Yeah, and then you end up going to college and getting your undergrad. No, and you don't I went go. into the military. You went to the military? I went to the Air Force. Whoa, okay, plot mm -hmm. twist. Yeah. Tell me about that. Oh, that was not for me. No, <laughs> I did not know that, okay. No, I wanted to travel and see the world, and they put me in Dover, Delaware, and didn't let me leave. Oh no! So I was like, I'm out. <laughs> How long did you spend in, in Air Force? I was supposed to be in for four years, but I got I got I, they let me out early for two years because I requested it. I was just so upset with it all. Wow. Yeah. So they were like, Yeah, sure, we'll let you out because at the time, you know, they was they don't have the shortings, the staff shortages yeah. they have now. Yeah. But I was it was just not for me. And you, it wasn't for you because you, you felt like it was they kind of hit you with the bait and switch because you wanted to go travel, see the world, and that's not what it was. It was that. It was also just the the. Um, the rigorous order, the pointless meetings you have to go to, just didn't really feel like it was fit for me, you know. And I, I wanted to study, I wanted to read more, and so I got out. Yeah, 
So you did two years, and then you what? You get an honorable discharge or a dishonorable, or what they give you? They got honorable. Yeah. Honorable discharge, and because this honorable is only for like wild, wild stuff, right? You, right. You're a good guy. Yeah. So you get out, and then you, uh, and then what happens next? Then I uh, started looking at undergraduate degrees, and I decided I'll go and study film okay. and cinema and digital arts, so I could be a video editor, because I knew getting a philosophy degree, you know, I wouldn't be able to pay the bills. Right. And I was uh, also married at the time. So I got married a year after I got, or two years after I got out of them. And so I was like, yeah, I'll need to take care yeah. of it. We this. got married a couple months apart. My, mm -hmm. Mine's is July and yours September? September, yeah. Yeah, same year. That's a trip. Mm -hmm. So you uh, want to learn video editing. And what year is this approximately? Because this is early if you're talking about 2008, 2009. Yeah, I started 27. 27. And you went back to school at 27? Yep. Got it. Okay. And that is what you kind of did to pay the bills for a while. Yeah, I did video editing. I would I go to college and I also had video editing jobs. Yeah. I had a security job. And so I, I had one semester where I'd have to get up on a Sunday morning, go to a, a film set all day, then work my security job at night, then get up and go do a film job that I had, go to class, go back to my security job so I wouldn't sleep for 48 hours. This was uh, in Delaware or out here? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Okay. Pittsburgh. Wow. So that's an interesting origin in the sense of many of us who got on YouTube usually did some sort of film stuff, right? Like, so you skill stack this, like, desire for apologetics with the practical aspect of doing the execution of the films and yeah. the execution of the shooting. Were you thinking that out? Or were you just like, I need to pay the bills and I know I'm not going to make a bunch of money if I get a philosophy degree, but I could do something semi-cool? Or were you starting to see the genesis of YouTube? No, I no, no one at the time knew what YouTube could be at, the, at that point. Mm -hmm. I just, when I got done with college, it was like 2011, I couldn't get a job right away. And so I'm sitting at the security job all night where I have to do nothing, just sit there, just be a presence on the site. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I got free internet. I could just start making some videos to wait past the time. Mm -hmm. So that's how that all started. Wow. And what was your very first upload on YouTube? 2011. <laughs> this is early. Yeah, what was your first upload? It's no longer on. But it was, oh. Yeah, it was on the Trinity. I was trying to explain it from a, like a, a more logical perspective. And I uh -huh. realized I made some errors in it. So. Uh -huh. You know, I, I revisited it years later and redid that video, and I'm probably going to redo it again eventually because I found some new stuff I would like to add into it. But, uh, yeah, that was my first one. And then I did some videos on the ontological argument, which are still up. Yeah. But, I mean, I— So you I, have videos going back to 2011, 2012. 2012, I'd say, yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And so at what point were you like, okay, this can be a career in terms of, like, <laughs> fusing the video with the, with the philosophy and apologetics on YouTube? Well, I started doing YouTube. I, I got so my goal was originally just to do like thirteen or fourteen videos, and then like there I've contributed. I'm done, but people ask me to do more, so I did more. Uh, kept trying to do them. I thought it was working out kind of well, and so by about 2014, I hated the job I had. It was just awful, and I was like, maybe I could ask for donor support. Mm -hmm. So I did. Didn't get a lot. Started to file the 501c3, and I was like, I gotta keep building it up. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe 2017 or so. I was like, I bet if I just really hunker down and ask for more um, support, maybe offer some perks, mm -hmm. I could get it. So about 2019 is when I was able to go full time. Okay. And so 20, what year did you start your nonprofit? Oh, that's a good question. I was working on it in Arizona. So it'd be maybe, I think I got it maybe 2017, 2016, somewhere okay. in there. And then what are you kind of doing to sustain yourself throughout this whole process just to, to burn money and stuff? Working for a media company, standing okay. around me, I'm filming houses, filming interview stuff, just whatever, odd jobs. Like I worked for a guy who had a media company and uh -huh. I was basically his video guy. Yeah. And finally, things kind of all click. You got the nonprofit going. You're, cons you're more consistent. And then 2019 is when it all went full time for you. Yeah, it was like November of 2019. So just before COVID hit. Wow. Perfect timing. Yeah. yeah. And you said you, John McRae, David Wood, a bunch of Mike Winger, a bunch of other Christian creators, you guys like all got together and did some sort of like YouTube boot camp, right? Well, what happened was, is in 2019, 2019 in November, uh, I was in, I was encouraged to go to the ETS conference, Evangelical Theological Society Conference. Okay. It was in, it was in San Diego here at that mm. time. So, and Mike Winger was there. David Wood was there. John McRae was there. Uh, and we all like hung out and did some stuff. And David Wood wanted mentioned that he wanted to get everyone together uh, to talk about growing on YouTube, to networking. So he got us all to a house in South Carolina in February, so just before COVID hit. Wow. And, yeah, we all hung out there and did a big stream together. It was great, yeah. Wow. I think I just stumbled across Mike Winger 
right before COVID. And I think uh, John McRae shortly after. Mm -hmm. So that's right when I've kind of started watching them. I think I came across your stuff probably that same year or later. And would you say that gathering with other creatives was was like influential in kind of helping you propel into like making YouTube something that's flourishing? Yeah, I mean, it definitely got me the support I needed because when I started full time, I wasn't fully funded. Mm -hmm. uh, and so networking helps you grow. And that's why I'm always happy to network and work with other creators on anything uh, yeah. like you. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, we're, we're, all, we're on the same team. So I'm always happy to help and yeah. come out and do stuff like this because that helps me grow. And then more people see my videos and then more people come to Christ. And that's what yeah. I want. Yeah. Amen. That's awesome. So... There's so many things that I think your channel is known for, right? I think when people think of inspiring philosophy, the, my my favorite stuff is the takedown of the pagan. Everything's a pagan holiday. Yeah, that was a side project that I started. I, I just got annoyed from debating fundamentalists that said, don't celebrate Christmas because it's sinful. And I'm yep. like... I'm sorry. Do you do you understand how sin works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't. You're not sinning against God if you put up a pine tree in your home. Yep. And so at the time, I was like, yeah, of course, Christmas is pagan, but it's not sinful. But then I started researching it, and mm -hmm. I found out, wow, Christmas just isn't pagan. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did. That became a side project, and it's just ironically has become something that I'm known for yeah. is debunking that. But it was never my main goal. Yeah. When you say fundamentalist, how would you define that term? So I define it more as how sociologists define it, because okay. that's the research I've been in a lot lately. Uh, and they define it as like someone who's got to take a strict literal reading of the Bible. Mm -hmm. You hold a very fringe views, not mainstream Christian. So fundamentalist tends to be people more on the outskirts to take literal readings of the Bible. Uh, they have certain traditions they that they hold to. Uh, you know, like those women have to dress a certain way mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You have to believe a certain way. Mm -hmm. It's not mainstream Christianity, according to sociologists. Yeah. And then would you would you kind of, would you identify, not denominationally necessarily, but like kind of as a, like an evangelical, neo-evangelical? Would that be a fair assessment of folks that aren't fundamentalists that are mainstream Christians? I mean, mainstream Christians are going to be, I would I would define them as orthodox, in orthodox. Within, within the lines of orthodox. Yeah. Catholic, so not necessarily uh, evangelical. No, Catholic, orthodox, Protestant. Okay. You know, so Catholic, Orthodox, Presbyterian, Lutheran, uh, Anglican up until recently. Uh, they kind of went off the deep end, as yep. we all know. Yep. Uh, I mean, you know, Baptists, these kind of groups. Got it. You know, and then you have the fundamentalist Baptists, which I would say on the, are on the fringe. Yep. And the, so, and where does the title of neo-evangelical play into that, that category? I mean, I would say a lot of evangelicals are Christian. Got you. Some of them are, can go a little off into the charismatic region. Yep. Uh, but most evangelicals, I would say, are Christian. Got you. So... You start doing these 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 pagan videos. Tell me what was the most egregious thing about that paradigm that kind of infuriated you to make these response videos that every holiday is not a pagan holiday. Because fundamentalists were telling Christians don't celebrate these holidays because you're sinning. God hates it when you hide Easter eggs mm -hmm. or when you let your kids go out and get candy on October 31st. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is just antithetical to biblical theology, to biblical ethics. Mm -hmm. This is... Christ gave us a spirit of victory, not a spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. The devil has no power in candy. Mm. He's got no power in Christmas presents. Mm -hmm. What are we afraid of? Yeah. You know, it was just absurd to me. It was clearly legalism. It was bringing mm. back these, this pharisaic mindset mm -hmm. that we have to do certain rituals to please God that are just beyond the confounds of Scripture. And it, it was terrifying because it's just going to, you're giving the devil ground that he does not have. Mm. He does not own Easter. He does not own Christmas, Valentine's Day. Uh, and we're just going to let him take those. No, let's use them to honor God yeah. uh, because there's nothing wrong, nothing inherently sinful about him. And so when fundamentalists say things like, it's wrong to celebrate these holidays, I'm always like, why? Mm. How, how are you sinning? Mm. What is actually going on there? And yep. you get these ad hoc, quite frankly, stupid arguments that, that just come across as just they have not done any research and they're living in fear. They, yeah. it's, it's terrifying. and I don't want them to thrust it on the rest of the church. Yeah. Do you think some of this, because when I've had these conversations, it seems like it really comes down to who are your sources? Yeah. Right? And and kind of like a, I don't say competition, but a ranking of who are credible scholars and who are non-credible scholars. Because they have their scholars, or quote-unquote scholars, right, mm -hmm. that they'll pull from. Um, but then, is, is that what you say, like the crux of it was going to go down to is who you're going to cite as scholars? Yeah. I, I mean, they don't have scholars, really. Okay. Uh, you, you can find a random historian saying, yeah, Christmas is pagan, but when they don't ever give sources. Got it. Every scholar I can find that actually gives you citations yeah. 
uh, will say there's no evidence any of these holidays. Halloween, Christmas, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Easter, none of them go back to paganism. Uh, and I have the primary sources to show that. Yeah. I, you can find a random guy on the History Channel's website saying, yeah, it's pagan. Yep. But they, they say it without evidence. They yeah. just make these blanket statements. Yeah. And then what about this whole assertion? And we talked a little bit about Constantine yesterday, but this whole assertion that, like, Constantine assimilated everyone because he wanted to use Christianity as, like, a political tool, and that's how we got these hybrid holidays. Yeah, it's pure and utter nonsense. Okay. Uh, first of all, Constantine converting to Christianity was more of a liability in that day and age. It didn't mm. help him control the masses. At the time, historians will note that maybe 5% of the Roman Empire was Christian. Right. So you, you could think of it like the president today becoming like a member of like, you know, uh, some obscure religion like Zoroastrian, mm -hmm. like like let's say the president just became a Zoroastrian mm -hmm. today. Like, oh wow, like that would be a, it's an obscure religion that very few Americans have. So, wouldn't really help him. It'd be more yeah. of a liability. Yeah. Same with Constantine. Okay. So the 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 military and the pagan elite at the time were not Christian. Very okay. few were, and the Christian church had just been under uh, serious persecution, where they lost land. Uh, there was no, there was nothing Constantine really had to gain from mm. converting to this. So it probably was more of a genuine conversion, mm. which is interesting. Uh, and so, and he comes in, he doesn't change theology. Christians believed in the Trinity before that. Christians were worshiping on Sunday before that. Christians were celebrating Christmas mm -hmm. and Easter before Constantine. Mm -hmm. He just made it more public, more well-known. More people were coming into the church now that it was a legal religion. Mm -hmm. And so Constantine just allowed Christianity to grow because it was no longer being heavily persecuted. You know, and thank God for that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so there's no, there's no basis of truth to any of the combining Roman things with Christian things to kind of make everyone happy. That's not, no, that, no, there, no, there's no that. basis to that at all, other than maybe some obscure, petty things, you know, like maybe we'll use some, like some similar language, mm -hmm. you know, to, you know, but we do that today. Like people, pastors will give sermons and they'll, use football analogies, talk about Jesus is the real quarterback kind of mm -hmm. thing, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you can see Christians doing that. But no, there was nothing religious that came into the church uh, from paganism. Yeah. Uh, everything you, you're you getting from, A, the prior uh, Jewish background, mm -hmm. uh, the Hebrew scriptures, the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, and then the early church fathers. That's where Christianity comes from. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you mean to tell me Easter is not pagan? No, there's it's, it's very not pagan. Okay. No, it's... uh. It's basically the holiday. Easter is Christian in origin. Uh -huh. The reason why we call it Easter in Germanic and English languages is because it comes from the months of Ostara Manath, uh -huh. which was basically the month that fell around April. So mm -hmm. people just started calling it, you know, the Ostara Manath celebration, got shortened to Easter. Anything outside of Germanic and English languages, they mm -hmm. call it the Pascha mm -hmm. or some sort of derivation of Passover. Yep. Because that's what it was based on. Yep. Jesus was crucified at Passover, so it's the Pascha celebration. Yeah, yep. I so think we say, what, we say something like that in Russian too, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. It, it it doesn't come from paganism. It comes from celebrating uh, the resurrection. Uh, they'll try to draw connections to uh, bunnies and, and rabbits and God, The god of Esther, something like that? So there was a there was a uh, Germanic spring goddess named name Oster, Ostra, uh -huh. and she may have been named for the month. Uh -huh. So the month Ostara Manoth may have been named after a month. That goddess. Yeah. But I mean, like, this is like assuming the 4th of July is pagan because it's named after Julius Caesar. Mm. It, it doesn't follow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Again, Easter, the actual celebration, comes from the Pascha. Mm -hmm. uh, we know nothing about this goddess other than she was a spring goddess in Germanic regions. Yeah. We have no evidence she was connected to eggs or bunny rabbits. Mm -hmm. Bunny rabbits don't become associated with Easter until about the 1500s. Mm. And what happens is, is you, you'd see Easter, you'd see, you'd see rabbits... In spring, quite often when the Easter celebration was going on, they were often associated with the Virgin Mary, so that came out. Eggs came from Lent. Uh, you, during, in the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't eat animal products during Lent. Mm -hmm. But eggs, if you hard-boiled them, could save. So towards the end of Lent, they'd start saving the eggs, and then they'd decorate them yeah. around Easter. So yep. th this is all Christian stuff in origin. Yeah. Nothing we have in modern-day Easter goes back to paganism. Interesting. What, what The one I find most egregious is when people say... St. Patrick's Day is pagan, which is which is so funny because St. Patrick was a missionary yeah. that goes that goes here and into Ireland and immerses himself in their culture and their customs. But the majority of Ireland ends up becoming converted because of him. Yeah, 
Um, what are your thoughts on St. Patrick's Day kind of being lumped in with that? Well, I mean, it's a much later holiday than mm-hmm. St. Patrick that was sort of like retrojected onto the past. Yeah. You know, like honoring saints, St. Valentine's Day, same kind of thing. You mm-hmm. know, as it come back to like the 1300s, mm-hmm. long after paganism. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was just kind of this thing. Let's honor this great saint of Ireland. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll have a holiday for him. There's no evidence it was like co-opting some ancient Irish pagan holiday. It's yeah. just utter nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you looked at, uh, into the story of St. Patrick and just like what he did as a missionary and how rad that was? Yeah, he was taken as a slave into Ireland, yeah. fled, got back to Britain, and then was convicted to go be a missionary back to Ireland, which would, would have been terrifying for yeah. him at the time. But yep. he was very successful in Ireland. I mean, probably one of the most successful missionaries ever. And, you know, by the end of his life, like the majority of the island was Christian. And then shortly after, I mean, paganism basically died out. Yeah. And thank God for that. So, you know, uh, thanks to St. Patrick, I- Ireland became a great Christian nation. And not only that, they started preserving a lot of the ancient works. So mm-hmm. monks were getting copies of manuscripts from, you know, places like Rome and Constantinople, and then they were preserving them and keeping them in their monastery. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the ancient works that survived, we, we can thank Irish monks. Yeah, that's way cool, man. I, I've i always seen him as, a, as just someone that, there's a lot of inspiration to glean from as someone that wants to reach people in culture and how to do that without crossing the line of sinning, but at the same time being present and engaged with people right where they're at, meeting them right where they're at, contextualizing the gospel to them right where they're at. Yeah. I think that's a that's the thing that I've always appreciated about uh, St. Patrick. And it sucks that Christians will take it and be like, ah, that's pagan, you know? And the thing is that the human mind is not like uh, it does not like coincidences. Yeah. It does not like things not having meaning. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people just come up with their own European folk traditions in mm-hmm. the past, and they don't. And the modern human mind can't accept that. Why do we put up Christmas trees? Well, there's nothing in the Bible about pine trees, yeah. but we know pagans like trees in the past. It must come from <laughs> paganism. And you can you can kind of be, appreciate that. You can have a little sympathy yeah. for that mentality. Yeah. But that's just not how it actually right. happens. I mean, we know Christmas trees date back to roughly about the 1500s, yeah. have an entirely Christian origin, right. coming from most likely coming from these Adam and Eve plays that were yeah. performed on December 24th. Yeah. So it's it's just a very innocent origin, but people don't like that. It's got to be more complicated. So mm. people want to make it more complicated. Yeah. You mentioned the manuscripts being passed and preserved by some Irish monks right mm-hmm. earlier. Um Textual criticism, I feel like, is something you're fairly versed in, mm-hmm. in terms of how we came to have our modern-day Bible translations. Um, but you also hold an interesting view of the the Bible is reliable, mm-hmm. but you don't necessarily hold to, like, inerrancy. Mm-hmm. Am, I, am I articulating it correctly? Yeah, because I don't even know what inerrancy means anymore. It's yeah. defined differently by person to person. Yeah. I mean, I could argue the original, uh, whatever the original authors wrote was inerrant, but obviously the scri- there are scribal errors. Just mm-hmm. compare Kings and Chronicles. Yes. I mean, you can't get around that. Right. So, yeah. I mean, but I, I would say it's clearly reliable to what was originally written. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we read the Gospels, I would argue, for example, John is an eyewitness account. Mm-hmm. It's the disciple of John who I'd called John the Elder. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark is clearly the... Uh, what was given to him by Peter, who was an eyewitness. Luke mm-hmm. talked to eyewitnesses as well. Mm-hmm. Matthew was an eyewitness, so he takes what Peter was preaching and supplements it with his own uh, memories and traditions. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think it's very much reliable to what was originally written. And there's a lot of ways we can argue for that. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you make of people that, that hold to a firm infallibility or inerrancy? It's damaging because children are raised in that mentality Mm -hmm. they're told that what they're reading is absolutely infallible and it's very easy to debunk that again just compare differences in totals and kings and chronicles Mm -hmm. and people get bothered by that and they go well this is and then they throw the baby out with the bathwater. we go well if it's not perfect it couldn't have come from a perfect god it must just all be wrong Mm -hmm. and you don't want to set your children up for that yeah yeah that's good because i think there's something there's there's a difference between something but there's a difference between saying the scriptures preserve the message of Jesus and what God did to engage with this creation versus saying all of this is literally the words of God. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, like, like, because like, I think that could get problematic. And just, and I've, I've referenced it a couple times. It's just, just saying, like, like, the majority of Job shouldn't be like written read as the literal words of God. It's Job's goofy friends arguing with them mm-hmm. about why Job's having a hard time. And then God comes at the end and is like, you guys are stupid. Like you guys are dumb. 
And so you don't approach Job in the same way you would approach the Gospel of Matthew. You would mm -hmm. totally approach it differently. So I think even before we even get into the textual criticism, but the, just the categorization of the different books, mm -hmm. I think people just gloss over and just like, this is all the literal words of God. And I go, no, I don't think, I don't think you mean what you think you mean with that. Yeah, and people, that's a good point you make because a lot of the times things happen in the Bible, they're descriptive. They're mm -hmm. not prescriptive. Mm -hmm. So take take an interesting passage, Numbers 31. This is one of the hardest passages in the Bible. Moses is, uh, God tells Moses to avenge Israel, make war on Midian. Mm -hmm. And so they do that. And then Moses comes out and goes, why did you bring back the women and the children? You're supposed to kill them all. So kill everyone except the young girls, leave them for yourselves. Mm -hmm. So Christians go, oh my gosh, this is horrible. Why would God command that? Hold on. Did God command that? Mm -hmm. Did God say, kill all everyone, but leave the girls for yourselves? Mm -hmm. No. Moses said that mm -hmm. apart from God entirely. And it's, he was angry, so Moses is doing this out of his own anger. Wow. So you got to take this in context. That's good. So Moses is, is commanded by God to avenge Israel on Midian's, uh, to go after Midian. So they yeah. do that. Then Moses comes out without consulting God. How dare you let the women and children live? Kill all the boys, kill mm -hmm. all the women. Okay. God didn't ask for Moses to do that. Okay. He goes above and beyond. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we see descriptions in the Bible without them being prescriptions or mm -hmm. commands from God. Mm -hmm. So they're not permissions. They're not prescriptions. They're not even uh, sanctioned by God. Mm -hmm. Abraham does a lot of hard, bad things. Mm -hmm. David does a lot of bad things. Mm -hmm. That does not mean it's always sanctioned or allowed by God. Yeah. So when we read something like Numbers 31, we got to be very careful. Yeah. Okay. Even Jewish scholars like Robert Alter will note, this is coming from Moses, mm -hmm. not from God. It's coming from Moses in his anger too. Mm. And what's also interesting is they'll say, well, this is clearly child brides. They're taking in these women and saying, oh yes, you know, we can have these, you know, these girls. But remember, uh, God told Moses to go after Midian and avenge him because they were sleeping with prostitutes in Midian. Mm -hmm. So, who does Moses? Who is Moses later angry at? All the women that Moses that that, that um, all the women that Israel was sleeping with, mm -hmm. but he doesn't want them to hurt the girls because they weren't being slept with. Mm -hmm. that, that tells us Israel was not sleeping with children. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they're not being told to take child brides. They were leaving the girls alone because Israel was not actually going and sleeping with these girls. Yeah, yeah. So, and I'm sure there's multiple examples we can look like that. Look at that in in scripture. Just kind of people either totally getting it, the context wrong or under, misunderstanding that there's hyperbole being used, you know, where you're talking mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, I want you to annihilate these people. Yeah. I want you to wipe these people out. Well, that's a good point. If you yeah. go through Joshua, Judges, you see this... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Got something stuck in my throat there. So if you go through Joshua, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 15 is brought up again where mm -hmm. God says, you know, kill all the Amalekites, Amalekites every man, woman, and child. Yeah. Read a little further later in First and Second Samuel... Uh, David is still fighting Amalekites. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I thought they were wiped out. Yep. This is ancient Near Eastern hyperbole. Yep. It's like us saying, did you hear about the football game? Right. The w Team A annihilated Team B. They right. were utterly destroyed. No one was left alive. Yep, yep, yep. We see this in the annals of Tutmosis III, in Assyrian annals, yeah. and Sumerian annals. The scholar Karen Ray Mitnijat wrote in her book, uh, Daily Life in Ancient Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. that you'll see in Sumerian mm, Akkadian annals that this idea that they utterly annihilated everyone, but then you'll read later they brought all these people back to be slaves. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a minute. What happened? Did they did they annihilate them or did they bring them back to be slaves? Right, 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 right. right, right. It's ancient Near Eastern hyperbole. The book of Joshua is very much in that same genre. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth Kitchen talks about this in his book on the reliability of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You'll see places in Joshua where it says, like, they annihilated everyone, and then it talks about survivors right after that. Yep, yep, yep. So you, don't give me this crap. Interpret it in its ancient Near Eastern context. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's good. If you w don't hold to the word inerrancy or infallible, how would you describe the scriptures? What would be a, like, reliable? Would it just be just as simple as reliable, or how would you describe? Reliable and true in describing what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. So that is what I would uh, use. We have to remember these were oral cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't think about text the way we do. They mm -hmm. were more concerned with preserving the message. Mm -hmm. So so preserved? You would use the word preserved? Yeah, they preserved the message yeah. is what I would say. So like, all right, let's say Moses writes Deuteronomy down. He, he gives a speech to Israel. The scribes take it all down. Great. Okay, well, by the time you get to the Babylonian exile, mm -hmm. the language has drastically changed. And a yep. scribe is looking at this going, oh, man, no one is going to understand this. Let's Let's update it with the modern language. But they're not just going to translate it word for word. They're going to update it with like modern understanding of mm. words, how they understand these types of things, because yeah. they want to make sure the message is preserved. Mm. They're not 
worry about exact wording like we would be today. Yeah, yeah. Now we see this today. You'll see like the NIV translation. That's a dynamic equivalent translation. Mm -hmm. They're more interested in preserving the message yeah. than getting the exact wording mm -hmm. yeah. as best they can. And that's just going to happen with language barriers. Yeah. So we even do it today, but for some reason we project this weird standard onto the Bible that they had to preserve it word for word for word for word, and that's just not how anyone today or in an ancient world would have thought of it. They wanted to preserve the message, and yeah. I think they did. Well, as someone who speaks Russian, that was my first language, it's difficult to even translate sentences with any degree of uh, <coughs> coherency from Russian mm -hmm. to English word for word, right? Just, just like two modern languages. So I can't even imagine trying to translate ancient Hebrew or Koine Greek word for word. It's impossible. To English. You know, like it's 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 such an interesting, I think, false dichotomy people have. Like either it's perfectly literal word for word or it's not. Right. And it's wrong. And it's not true. Yeah, and it's a false dichotomy we have for yeah. sure. It's unfortunate. Uh so well not a false dichotomy, I don't know why I said that. Uh but yeah it's um it's just a weird thing we project onto the ancient world. Yeah. People always judge the Bible uh, in a way that we wouldn't judge any other ancient texts. Yeah. And it bothers me because when I was challenged early on in my life, someone said, don't treat the Bible as if it's inerrant or divine. Mm -hmm. Don't treat it as if it's all wrong. Judge it like you would judge any other ancient work, like, you know, Tacitus, Suetonius, Josephus, yeah. Philo. Judge it like that. Yeah. And then so when you read Josephus, you apply the principle of charity. Yeah. Well, I apply that to the biblical text, and mm. then I became a Christian again. Yeah. So and I, I, a lot of times I see skeptics don't do that. So a debate I love to have with skeptics is not, did Jesus rise from the dead? I like to have a debate with skeptics. Was Jesus buried in a tomb? Mm -hmm. Why? Because a lot of them deny that he was, and that he was just sort of left on the cross to rot. Huh. And so I go, okay, let's have this debate. Yeah. Now, this is not a miracle claim because being buried in a tomb is something that naturally happens. Yeah. Let's see if you're judging these texts fairly. And I don't think they are. I think they are. they hold to this weird standard then I can show a lot of evidence that Jesus was buried, as I have in the past. And I basically argue that you're not being charitable with these texts mm. that clearly teach Jesus was buried in the tomb. You're you're taking these obscure second or third hand sources. They're talking about various other places in the Roman Empire, applying yeah. them to Judea. You don't want to take first hand sources about practices in Judea, like what we get from Josephus or yeah. from actual archaeological data. Yeah. And so, you know, I like to have that debate. And I think those are successful in showing that. They are not actually judging the biblical text they, like they judge other ancient texts. They're not extending the same charity that they would. No. It's, it's interesting when you hear folks reference like the Gnostic Gospels or <laughs> reference like, well, there was lots of other Messiah-like figures who pre predicted their own death and then died and supposedly rose and were no. virgins and all this stuff. And I'm like, you if you just extended the same courtesy and charity to the New Testament documents— as you do to all these other sources that are nowhere near as reliable in terms of scripture from antiquity, you would be much more reasonable to discuss this with. But you're pulling obscure, random parallels of other quote unquote messiahs or whatever and ignoring that the, the greatest documents from antiquity are the New Testament documents. Yeah, and we don't have any Jewish messiahs that predicted they would die and rise from the dead. We don't have any Jewish movements that thought that their messiah's death was ordained by God and that he physically resurrected, and this proved he was messiah. Only the Christians said that about Jesus. Hmm. You notice the Christians don't also— like some will say that uh, the Christians just—this is how they talked about dead people. Mm -hmm. You know, when Jesus died, they talked about him as being resurrected, and then later Christians interpreted this as a physical resurrection. Notice there were other— martyrs in the church like john the baptist stephen mm -hmm. none of the christians said they physically resurrected yeah they only said this about jesus so only the christian movement said only jesus resurrected mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no other jesse jewish messianic movement said their messiah died and rose the christians didn't say this about other saints of the past they didn't say yeah. it about old testament saints yeah so there's something unique about jesus yep. uh, that doesn't compare to anything in the background knowledge yeah yeah that's good um what would you define as the essentials of Christian orthodoxy in terms of doctrine? So, uh, most essential thing is the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay. There is one God, God is three persons, and each person is fully God. That's essential. Can't get so, around that. So, oneness or out? Absolutely. Okay. I, I have no exceptions. You deny the Trinity, you're out. So, Arians, oneness, Pentecostals, yeah, out, totally. Okay. Don't, don't bring that modalist crap here. Going to hell. 
I wouldn't say going to hell. Okay. I would say they're outside of orthodoxy. Got it. Okay. Uh, I mean, Jesus, when he was going in the Gospel of John through the Samaritan region, he said, I have sheep not of this flock. I think it's still possible for them to be saved. Mm -hmm. I'm just skeptical of it. Got it. I'm skeptical of anyone who denies the Trinity. Mm -hmm. So I cannot confirm anything with what they say. Yep. So Trinity is essential. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Uh, so he was born to a woman who had, did, did not have sex ever before. Mm -hmm. And it was not through sex. It was through conception of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So that's essential. Jesus uh, physically died on the cross, physically buried, physically rose from the dead three days later. Mm -hmm. So his actual body was reanimated. Uh, and he was in his same body. was a new glorified body. Uh, he ascended into heaven, another essential doctrine. He will physically return. Uh, Holy Spirit is um, came down at Pentecost, I'd say is essential. Uh, inspiration of scripture. Uh, all 66 books were inspired by God uh, to teach the essentials of the faith. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would say those are the essentials of the faith for yeah. sure. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. Uh, saved by grace. Saved uh, by grace through faith. I would say is also essential. Yeah. Um, would you say that folks who may not hold to a saved by grace through faith alone are still within orthodoxy? Like if you have other camps that are maybe they're adding some sort of works, like like some would say Catholics add some degree of works to mm -hmm. salvation. Well, how do you how do you navigate that conversation? Because I know you're very friendly with Catholics as well. Yeah, I think Catholics are Christian for sure. Uh, so I mean, I don't have anything. I think I think the, the Catholic Protestant hate just needs to stop. Yeah. Uh, there was a great book called uh, the Handbook of Christian Apologetics, which I think Christians should read. I like every chapter except chapter two, but they have a great book on salvation in there, mm -hmm. uh, and they know. Look, here's the thing: Catholics and Protestants basically agree. We're just using different terminology. Okay. When Catholics say salvation. They agree we are saved by grace through faith. They don't disagree with Paul. Mm -hmm. But when they say salvation, they're talking about the whole process, including sanctification. Mm -hmm. So they're saying that is all salvation. Mm -hmm. Whereas when Protestants talk about salvation, they're talking about regeneration, mm -hmm. the initial uh, uh, act where we become saved, we enter into the kingdom. Yeah. So yes, Catholics agree, but when they talk about salvation, they're including sanctification as well, mm. which is where we... Christ slowly sanctifies us and makes us perfect, mm -hmm. morally perfect over time. Yeah. So we got to make sure we're all speaking the same language, and I think Catholics and Protestants are just not, and that's why there's this confusion that happens. Interesting. So you say it's a language disagreement. Yeah. Yeah, I like that everything you cited sounds like it goes back to the early creeds. Yeah. Is that fair? The Nicene Creed, I think that sounded like the, mostly everything for the Nicene Creed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now... Something else that gets you in trouble with fundamentalists is your views on creation. Mm -hmm. And you hold the position of theistic evolution. Yeah. So could you unpack that a little bit? And why would you say that, that where someone falls on theistic evolution or creation, literal six-day account, old earth, gap theory, theist, full-on theistic evolution. Mm -hmm. um, one, so just help me understand why that's not essential and why sometimes conflating it as an essential is not helpful. Yeah. And then two, kind of what specifically your views are. And you have debates on this. I don't want to go super duper in deep because you have some really good debates on this. But uh, yeah, if you want to take that. Yeah, so for one thing, uh, I think people, when they hear theistic evolution, they think we're denying essential core doctrines. I'm not. So I affirm there was an historical Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. I affirm there was an, an actual historical garden in a place called Eden. Mm -hmm. There was an actual tree. There was an actual fall. Mm -hmm. All that's compatible with theistic evolution. Mm -hmm. Noth I'm not contradicting anything, I believe. God created everything. Mm -hmm. He's the creator of all, according to as John 1, 1 to 3 says. Mm -hmm. uh, and I affirm there was a literal fall. So what am, what am I? What heresy am I holding to? None. Mm -hmm. I affirm all of that right mm -hmm. there. So mm -hmm. why would I deny evolution if I can hold to all essential Christian doctrines? Interesting. So I think that's what people confuse. They hear theistic evolution and they think you're denying something essential to the faith, and I'm not. Mm -hmm. So right then and there, there, there's no problem there. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, in terms of the other people, because basically your, the view of theistic evolution is that Genesis 1 is the account of all creation over evolution. It's, it's not literal. It's more, I guess, allegorical, metaphorical. Yeah, well, let, let, my, let's talk about my view on this. So, again, I affirm all essential Christian doctrines here. So what is, I don't say the Bible teaches an evolutionary account of history. Mm -hmm. You're saying it's compatible. I say it's compatible. Gotcha. You know, there, 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 there are two different categories. It's like saying, does the Bible teach calculus? Yeah. You know, it's not the same thing. So, yeah. so I try to interpret Genesis one in its ancient Near Eastern context. Mm -hmm. Now, look at what Genesis is doing. People have all often brought this up. What's happening on day four? How mm -hmm. do you have night and day 
morning and evening before the sun and the moon are created yeah. on day four. Yep, yep, yep. So that's a problem. Yep. So some will try to say there's another light source, which is yeah. not in the Bible. So here's <laughs> here's an example of a young Earth creationist adding to the Bible. Ah. Another light source that's not in there. Yeah. Uh, so day one, light is created. Yep. Day four, the luminaries are created. Yep. Day two, the sea and the sky are created. Day five, the animals that inhabit them are created. Yeah. Day three, the land and the vegetation. Day six, animals on the on the land. Yeah. Notice a pattern. Yeah. You have a, almost a framework here. Day one corresponds to day four. Uh -huh. Day two corresponds to day five. Day three corresponds to day Interesting. six. Interesting. Okay. This is not chronological order. This is a framework order. Uh -huh. They're doing this on purpose. Okay. And it shows intimacy with God. The the day three and six, you get more closer to where God is going to make his um uh, his presence dwell, which mm -hmm. is be on the land with the humans. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is sort of what's going on. Now, compare Genesis 1 to Jeremiah 4. Mm -hmm. If you read Jeremiah 4, he's talking about how the northern kingdom was basically destroyed by Assyria. And he's saying, Judah, this is going to happen to you if you don't you know, shape up. Mm -hmm. well, how does he describe it? He says, it is formless and void. There is no man to work the field. Mm -hmm. There is no birds of the air. There is no vegetation. Mm -hmm. Sounds awfully familiar. Mm. It sounds very much like Genesis 1. And scholars will note, Jeremiah was aware of uh, Genesis 1 when he wrote this. Mm -hmm. So, but notice what he's doing. He's using the language of Genesis 1 to just say a kingdom went from a productive state to an unproductive state. Mm -hmm. Well, why couldn't Genesis 1 just be doing the exact opposite in reverse? Mm. So it's just saying God took a chaotic world mm -hmm. and he made it a productive world. Interesting. You know, you know, this, we see this on day four. The, the sun and the moon are going to be appointed to mark the days and the seasons. They're going to be used for marking things on the calendar. Yeah. You know, we're getting order handed to us. Yeah. Uh, tohu and bohu, the words used in Genesis 1 for formless and void. They don't really mean that. If you look at scholars like David Samuru or John Walton, they'll note it more likely refers to being unproductive. Yeah. So the earth was, uh, I know Robert Alter translated as welter and waste. Things were not just working the way they were supposed to. So God comes in and he says, all right, well, here the land is going to function as, um, as uh, to bring about vegetation. The seas are going to function or the water will function as seas. The mm -hmm. light will function as day. Then darkness will function as night. Yeah. The luminaries will function to give you calendar dates. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is how things are going to work in my new setup here. Yeah. This is what they're doing in Genesis 1. They're not, this is not a, creation story actually yeah. in in the ancient eastern context that makes sense yeah. compared to things like the enuma elish they are more focused on functionality how things worked in human civilizations so that's what they're focused on in this account yeah. and if that's the case that's totally compatible with an historical past of evolutionary theory because mm -hmm. that's not what they're trying to describe mm -hmm. we have just sort of thrusted our modern understanding onto the ancient text mm -hmm. and not read it in its cultural context so if you check go on my YouTube channel, Inspiring Philosophy, and you check out my Genesis 1 to 11 series, mm -hmm. I put them all in a playlist. I go through and I explain this in detail, how this is more about functionality, about how uh, this is God giving, uh, setting up the cosmos to be his cosmic temple, not him creating things materially. Got you. So uh, the Genesis 2 then is the actual account of Adam and God kind of stepping in and engaging Adam in a literal garden. Yeah, so... Genesis 2, 4 uses a uh, phrase called, these are the generations of. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Toledoth, and we see that show up in Genesis quite often. These are the generations of Terah. These are the generations of uh, Ishmael. So we go through all of these, and they're yeah. like, these are the generations of. These are the generations of. Mm -hmm. These always introduce what comes after that person. Mm -hmm. They're like chapter markers. Mm -hmm. the, the next thing that happened is this. Mm -hmm. What we see in Genesis 2, 4, that means... It's a chapter marker. It's basically saying this is the next thing that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not going back and filling in details on everything that happened on day six. Mm. And so scholars like Benjamin Kilker argue what actually is happening is day eight mm. of creation. Interesting. Uh, and so that means everything that happened on, in Genesis 1 already has happened. So when God called mankind, male and female, to be his image of God, mm -hmm. that happened before Adam was on the scene. Mm. So Michael Heiser will note... Uh, this is basically God saying humans, wherever they are or however many they are, mm -hmm. are now the image of God. Hmm. All right. Anyway, next part two. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to hone in on this specific area called Eden and everything's just going to happen there. I'm going to put a man and a woman mm -hmm. in this garden. It's going to function as the first temple. They're going to be my first priest and priestess. Mm -hmm. And they're just going to function as this is going to be function as the temple. The tabernacle mm -hmm. is very much based off Eden 
in a lot of ways. Mm. There's a lot of parallels between the tabernacle and the temple yeah. in Eden. So this is day eight of creation mm -hmm. count. Uh, so they're honing in on this specific area yeah. where God sets up his cosmic temple. Yeah. And so there are people on the earth who die before Adam and Eve. Yeah. And I think that's inherent in the text. There's a scholar named Joshua John Van E who wrote his dissertation, Death in the Garden. Now that we see evidence of death in Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. Uh, God tells humanity su to subdue the earth. Mm -hmm. And that word in Hebrew is very harsh. It's yeah. very harsh. It refers to conquest, mm -hmm. enslavement. Yep. Why would God, let me, here's a question for the young earth creationists. If God made everything perfect, there was no death or sin or anything mm -hmm. before Adam sinned, mm -hmm. why is God telling Adam to subdue the earth? Mm -hmm. It doesn't need subdued. It's already perfect. Mm -hmm. This implies it's not, it's chaotic. Mm -hmm. And this is what we see in Genesis 1. The, the earth was formless and void. It was chaotic. It was welter and waste. Mm -hmm. God starts to subdue it. Uh, but now he calls humanity to subdue it further for him. All mm -hmm. right, I'm going to work through my image bearers to, mm -hmm. to, conti to continue to subdue the earth because mm -hmm. it's still chaotic. Mm -hmm. Let's take Eden to the rest of the earth because mm -hmm. it's not perfect out there, guys. Mm -hmm. I need you to go out and make it perfect. Mm -hmm. And of course, we fell. Jesus came to restore that, and that's what we're going to. That's now what the church's job is to do, is to make the world perfect now. Yeah. So that's what we're seeing in Genesis 1. The other word is you have dominion over all the animals. That word is also very harsh. Mm. Uh, it it refers, again, to, like, again, harshly ruling over something. So mm. Joshua John Van e says animals were given to humans for however they wanted. And we see this in Genesis 9. People say this is when humans were first allowed to eat meat. Wrong. Uh, this is actually a restatement of the covenant that was given in Genesis 1. Mm. Early commentators like Philo of Alexandria even noted this. Genesis mm. 9 is just a repeat of everything that was given in Genesis 1. Mm. So animals are given for food because they were already given for food in Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. So read read up on Joshua John Vaney. You know, he goes through the Hebrew of Genesis 9 and Genesis 1 mm -hmm. and notes this is just a restatement of everything that happened in uh, Genesis 1. And you can see my video on Genesis 9 where I point that out. Interesting. What do you say when people say the idea that there was death before the garden, that, that that doesn't sound like what Paul is writing in terms of death entering through Adam? And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like Adam is the guy that blows it and then all of humanity. Oh, and then I was going to ask, would the people who were on earth outside of Adam, would did those people die off uh, or are those people still kind of like image bearers of God? Well, all humanity is the image of God. Let's be clear about okay. that. Uh, so, but Paul is using the same context we have, which is Genesis 3. And all Paul says is, death spread to all men. Well, how did death spread to all men? Well, we know. We can read in Genesis 3. Mm -hmm. God never curses Adam and Eve. He never changes their bodies from immortal to mortal. He curses mm -hmm. the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then he says, behold, you know, man has become like one of, a, one of us, knowing good and evil. Mm -hmm. We're going to cut him off from the tree of life. Mm -hmm. So the only way God allows humans to die is he says, no more tree of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that implies human was already mortal, and the only way we were immortal was the tree of life. Was the tree of life. Interesting. And this is, again, this is implicit in the text. When we see that God says, the day of you eat of it, you shall surely die. Mm -hmm. The Hebrew more likely means, as scholars like John Walton or Robert Alter will note, mm -hmm. it more likely means you'll be doomed to die. Mm. So if you eat from this, you'll be doomed to die. And how does God doom them to die? Just cuts them off from the tree of life. Mm. So they were already mortal. Hmm, so they were interesting. All, they were already mortal. And huh. how does death spread to all men? Well, they lose access to the tree of life through Adam. Huh. So that is how death spread to all humans. It's because we lost access to the tree of life, and now we have to die like so, the rest of nature. So was the tree of life kind of like a like a magical source of life for them? And if they were in the garden with the tree of life, they got to live. Yeah, you could basically argue that. Yeah, interesting. So, so yeah, I've never human, heard this before. Yeah, it's it's all you could check. Check out my Genesis one to eleven series. Uh -huh. I did. A video on each chapter. Uh -huh. I did some videos. I did two, and I just put it all on a playlist on my channel for people to go through. Easy access to find mm -hmm. it all. Just go to my playlist, Genesis one to eleven, uh, and I go up to the Tower of Babel and everything. So all of humanity doesn't come from Adam and Eve. All of our civilization doesn't come from Adam and Eve. It comes from there's other folks that we. Come I would from. say there were definitely other people outside of the garden uh -huh. that Adam represented before God, and all fell in him. So Adam was the priest that failed, and all fell with him. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the priest who succeeded, and we all succeed through him now. Huh. So how are we saved uh, through Jesus? Well, because he's our priest. He represents us before the Father. Yeah. He's the mediator, as Paul says. Huh. Uh, likewise, Paul was the other mediator, and he failed, and we all fell with him kind of thing. Mm. So it's that same kind of setup here. So if you accept that Jesus saves us through his atoning sacrifice, mm -hmm. you also have to accept that Adam's failure uh, also meant that we failed. If you want to accept the free gift of salvation, mm -hmm. you have to accept that we all fell in Adam as well. And that's how desperate all men, our priestly representative for God, failed. 
Mm. And therefore, we all fell with him. Mm -hmm. And so, luckily, of course, God you know, heals the situation through his yeah. own blood. Do you think Adam and Eve's descendants had babies with some of the other folks that weren't uh, necessarily their own descendants? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, uh, you know, this is a this is a weird thing. You know, we, we know from genetics. Those genealogies are very, like, you know— yeah, well, we know from genetics that you know you can't have incest. It's gonna it's gonna result in all sorts of birth problems. Look at the Egyptian pharaohs, for example, and all mm -hmm. the problems they have, uh, and on their mummies. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they got to they, they'd have incest, and then you know their you know their children's children couldn't breed because they were just so deformed. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's very it's very likely that you know Cain married someone outside of the garden. You know, when he gets cursed. Or by God, he says, you know, everyone's going to come after and kill me. Well, who? Your parents? Yeah, I always wondered about that verse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's implied. Yeah, it's very much implied that there were other people outside of the garden. Interesting. What um, isn't there some scientific stuff? Because I've seen stuff about like Eden being in modern, you know, Mesopotamia and Iraq, and but w there has been some stuff that came out recently about there being a literal Eve and 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 tracing a majority of human. So DNA th back to a little Eve? This or? is not the, the Eve from the Bible. This okay. is mitochondria Eve. It's an ancestor that's hundreds of thousands, I believe, older. Uh -huh. uh, and we everyone has a mitochondria descent from her. Now, today we are all descended from, from Adam and Eve in the Bible. There's a great book by uh, Joshua Swaminoff. Today we are all descended. We are Adam. everyone today. Genetically. I would say everyone by the time of Jesus was descended from Adam and Eve. Interesting. Uh, um, if if not, it would just have been obscure regions like uh, Tanzan... Um, Tasmania, for example. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking about when does Pangaea happen and everything. Oh, that that's long before humans ever, you know, were on the scene. Okay. You know, that's okay. that's way, way, way back in, you know, the age of the dinosaurs. I don't know the exact age yeah, it yeah. was. Uh, but how do, if Adam and Eve, if, if, if everything was already spread apart, all mm -hmm. the continents, and then Adam and Eve were in Mesopotamia-ish. Okay. Yeah, right? let's talk about that. How yeah. do those, how do folks uh, in Australia, how do humans end up in Australia? Good question. So let's first talk about the fact that, A, remember Genesis 1 says all humans are already the image of God. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. Everyone's the image of God. So, you know, that's it. Mm -hmm. But Joshua Salmonos wrote this book called The Genealogical Adam. Mm -hmm. not, not genetic Adam, genealogical Adam. Okay. Now think of it like this. So, you know, men pass their Y chromosome onto their sons. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Adam and Eve had da sons and daughters is what Genesis 5 says. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Adam did not pass his Y chromosome to his daughters. Okay. Now, if those daughters had sons, they didn't get genetic descent from Adam mm -hmm. because they didn't get a Y chromosome. So his sons got their Y chromosome from their grandfather, who was somebody else. Mm, interesting. So they are genealogically descended from Adam, even though their genetics come from this other guy. Mm -hmm. Same with mitochondria Eve. She didn't pass her mitochondria to Seth or Cain. Mm -hmm. So their Cain's daughters mm -hmm. would not have the genetic descent from Eve, you could yeah. say, yeah. but they're genealogically descended from him. Now, based on the way humans, you know, interbreed and spread out, we're all descended from like one guy that lived like 2000 years ago. Really? Yeah, because people descend out genealogically, we're all descent, even though we're not all genetically descent. We don't all get all the same genes from that one guy. Interesting. But, you know, technically, we, I even asked Josh, Joshua Swaminas this one time, could we all technically be descended from Abraham? He's like, oh, yeah, for sure. At this point, yeah. Huh. Yeah. I mean, because, but you're also descended from literally everyone else at that same time period. So, again, then how do people end up in the Americas? How do people well, end up in Australia? People keep spreading around, interbreeding. So I would place Adam and Eve at about 14,000 years ago. And so, oh, okay. So that's, okay. So the, the, the young earth would place yeah. in 6,000 years ago. So you got a bit more wiggle room if it's 14,000 years ago for them to then just travel and make it to the Americas. Yeah. But I mean, but e make it to Australia? Like, is it that its own land ma mass? Well, we know, for example, that Muslims uh, were trading with them huh. in 1500s and earlier groups were also trading with them through Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know there was a migration period. Some At some point in Australia, a bunch of people came from the region of India. We don't know how they got there. Hmm. Joshua Swamina cites other examples in his book. Like there's a guy in South America that had genetic descent from someone in Australia. You know, it's like, how wow. do you get all the way over there? Yeah. Well, again, you got to think of it like in terms of just the way people move. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if I have a couple children, uh, oh, you know, let's go back like 5,000 years. So some guy has children. They spread out. They spread out. In a couple generations, he's got genealogically descent for that whole you know, whole area. Mm -hmm. You, you think about one guy's got five children. Each of those children have five. That's five times five. That's 25 in, in three generations. Mm. And, you know, people just send out. They marry. They interbreed. They And it was a it's a common human practice for us to 
for tribes to work together by, you know, arranged marriages, yeah. you know. And so Swaminas ran the, it cited some models showing this can happen quite easily, really rapidly in the course of like a thousand years. Hmm. You can have genealogically descent across massive continents in just the course of a thousand years. So yeah. check out his book, The Genealogical Atom. Mm -hmm. And he just, he proved this with science, scientific studies. Yeah. Uh, Marcus Ross tried to respond to them. Swaminas responded on his blog and pointed out he misunderstood some of the models. Uh, I think Swaminas basically, you know, you know, responded to him quite adequately. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's not hard to show how this genealogically descent can happen within a few thousand years across the whole globe. Got you. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. that's so fascinating. We are all descended from Adam, and even if we, we weren't, we are all made in the image of God, according to Genesis yeah. 1. What do you think the dangers of not being open to what you just described with regards to being a Christian and not being open to the science and the in the the basic history of this stuff. You're going to cause a lot of young people to lose their faith in the next coming generations for sure. Mm. And I, I I'm, where's my camera? They're fundamentalists. I'm telling you, you will cause generations of Christians to lose their faith if you tell them they have to be a young Earth creationist to be a Christian. I've seen this happen time and time again today. Fundamentalist Christians grow up, they go to college. They realize there's a lot of evidence for evolution, and they throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm. You know, it'd be much better if we just say, "Hey, you know, let's teach core doctrines and uh, creation, how God made things, and how things got here." Well, there's many ways you could have done that, mm -hmm. but it's all compatible with Christianity. You're going to save a lot of, you know, a lot of you know, souls just by being open to that, because mm -hmm. I see this happen time and time again, and it's horrible. So it, it's it's scary. Here's what happens: is a lot of these kids are told over and over again. The Bible is incompatible with evolution. It's mm -hmm. incompatible. It's incompatible. Then they go to college and they start realizing that, it, oh, my God, there's a lot of evidence here for evolution. Yeah. What am I going to do? So they throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yep. And it's – or even if you don't think there's a lot of scientific evidence for evolution, you have to admit the whole scientific community, or at least 99 percent, agrees evolution happened. Mm. So it puts a lot of Christians in very difficult situations where they want to fit in. Yep. They want to agree with the science, but they don't feel like their faith can allow it. And so mm. they, they get rid of the faith. And that's horrible. So that's let's, let's stop that by just yeah. being open-minded about something that does not affect the actual core doctrines of the faith. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I also think the issue of dinosaurs arrives. Like we, we, we've gone to multiple dinosaur museums with me and my son, you know, mm -hmm. and there's like, doesn't the Young Earth create... Young Earth creationists position believe that humans and dinosaurs were on Earth together at the same time. Yeah, and they weren't. <laughs> uh, well, they're actually, they're, they're, humans and dinosaurs exist now. We just call them chickens. Oh, chickens! Yeah. I was going to thought you were going to say like lizards or like no. Some alligators. I mean, technically, most yeah, I believe bird, all birds are maybe it's all it could be most. I'm not a scientist. But yeah, they're descended from dinosaurs, and technically, they still are dinosaurs according to all mainstream scientists. Wow. So chickens. So when you eat chicken nuggets, you're eating dinosaur nuggets. Technically, I'm, I like nuggets. Yeah. yeah. So. But in terms of humans and Tyrannosaurus rexes mm -hmm. being on the earth at the same time. No. That didn't happen. Did not happen uh, for <laughs> sure. They were they wiped out about like 60 some million years ago. Uh, and that that's just a, a scientific fact at this point. Uh, yeah. so and we have no evidence of this. Um anytime we date rock layers in the fossils yeah. that are there, uh, they they don't align with any human layers. So we don't use carbon dating to date fossils. This is a, a young earth creationist myth. We use like things like uranium two thirty five dating, and every okay. time we date these layers and these fossils, yeah. they consistently line up with the evolutionary timeline hmm. with the layers. They do ne never once have we found fossils that would sort of fall out of that line. Um, some will cite um, fossils they'll find in uh, in the sea. Mm -hmm. They go, ah, the, the carbon dating is off for these. But there's a scientific effect called the reservoir effect, and it actually throws off the carbon dating for that, for mm -hmm. example. And mm -hmm. again, we don't carbonate fossils. Mm -hmm. Fossils, we have to use, because there's no minerals, that, I'm sorry, there's no carbon in them for us to date. It's all minerals. Yeah. So we have to use things like uranium-235. And again, these always line up with the basic timeline mm -hmm. that evolutionists have laid out. Or, or is there variation in there? Sure. Mm -hmm. But you don't get dinosaurs dated to 6,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. You don't get humans and <laughs> dinosaurs being found in the same rock layers, ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when you when you when you say it out loud, you know. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. Here's what I would say again: I encourage young Earth creationists to read what actual evolutionary biologists are saying because a lot of them don't. Yeah, I know because I was in that boat at one point. Yeah, and what again at this point, an atheist challenged me: just read what we're read the actual experts. Yeah, don't read what the young Earth creationists 
uh, sources have told you of the experts have yeah. said. Yeah. Actually read what the experts have said. Yeah. And then when I did, I became a theistic evolutionist. Yeah. What, what do you say to the person that says they struggle with the idea? They, they, they don't have an issue with microevolution, but macroevolution, meaning okay. everything comes from a fish that grows legs and then over millions of years it becomes a human. And then why did monkeys stop evolving? But, mm -hmm. you know... What do you say to that to that kind of stuff? My, macro evolution is just enough micro. It's just micro evolution plus time. Okay. Macro evolution is just micro evolution plus time. Okay. If you believe in an old Earth and you believe in micro evolution, you believe in macro evolution. You still want to accept it. You mm. you accept all the premises. So it will just happen. Here's the thing: with people don't let, let, let's talk about evolution here for a second because people don't understand what it is. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, people think evolution is one day. Uh, a deer turns into a dolphin. Mm -hmm. That's not what evolution says. If okay. that ever happened, that would debunk evolution. Okay. <laughs> so evolution is just that variation happens in a population of species over time. Okay. So eventually, so look at dogs, for example. All mm -hmm. dogs descended from wolves. Mm -hmm. So they technically are still canines. They're technically are still, all dogs are still technically wolves. They just, uh, they, they, they spread out and they vary. Yeah. So, they would say this is microevolution, though. Yeah, right? but yeah. Let, let's talk. So, like, so for example, a dog can still be a wolf, mm -hmm. and then a pug or a Great Dane can be a dog, but also be a pug and a Great Dane. Mm -hmm. Now, a Great Dane cannot turn into a pug. Mm -hmm. This is variation. They sort of split off. Mm -hmm. Everything that descends from the Great Dane will always be a Great Dane, but you're going to keep getting variation in the uh -huh. Great Dane. Okay. You're going to keep getting variation in the pug. Likewise with us, we are still tetrapods. Mm -hmm. We are still primates. Mm -hmm. We're still great apes. We're still hominids. We inherit everything our ancestors were, just with more variation. Mm. So we're still eukaryotes, even. Mm -hmm. You go back that far, we're still this thing. So this is all evolution is. It's just an, or a population of species just keeps uh, varying, just descending, reproducing, and splitting off and varying over time and over time. Mm. So we still inherit everything our ancestors are. This is why chickens are still dinosaurs. Dinosaurs just evolved a population just evolved and they still are dinosaurs but they just became chickens because they adapted to a new environment interesting so so this, humans instead of apes we basically adapted to a different environment is that kind of exactly. where it goes we are okay. still great apes we're still primates we're still mammals huh. okay there was there was original population of the first mammals mm -hmm. and then they just varied mm. so you know they split off one became the, the mice one became humans one became raccoons you know it, they you always inherit what your ancestors were mm. It's not that you become something new entirely. Yeah. You still inherit everything. You just vary. And you can see this in dogs. This yeah. is why I use dogs as, a, as an example because think of all the different breeds of dogs we have. Mm -hmm. Variation. A Great Dane, all of its all of its descendants will always be Great Danes. Mm -hmm. But there, a thousand years, there's going to be all different varieties of Great Danes because mm -hmm. variation over time. So what do you say to someone that says, well, that minimizes the role and the beauty of God's creation or intelligent design. What are you talking about? I think it makes it even more beautiful. You think, okay. okay. I, I think it does. Like God can create life that can just keep varying and changing and becoming these beautiful new things that yeah. can fit into these different niches. I think, I think it makes God's creation even more beautiful. Now, I'm not a, I wouldn't call myself a neo-Darwinian evolutionist. What is, what's the difference? So you basically, in, in evolutionary theory, there's a spectrum of Functionalism versus structuralism. Okay. Um, is function driving more evolution or is structure driving more evolution? Mm -hmm. I lean more towards the structuralist camp. Mm -hmm. Now, that would be like people like Michael Denton, Stephen Jay Gould, Simon Conway Morris, these type of thinkers. Uh, and, uh, so what they basically say, as a structuralist, this is what I say. There, There is, um, excuse me, there is, a, uh, in the universe, it, the universe has finely tuned natural laws to bring about life in certain ways. Mm -hmm. So Simon Conway Morris says, you know, if humans never came about in Africa, uh, there would have been human-like creatures that came out of South America eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, he basically says if you rewound the tape of life back to zero and started over, you would get human life again or something very similar. Mm -hmm. You started over, same thing would happen. Mm -hmm. And what he's basically arguing, Simon Conway Morris, is that there are these finely tuned structures in the universe, finely tuned natural laws, that force life to go about a certain way, mm -hmm. to become certain things. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, the more when we enter certain ecological niches, evolution converges mm -hmm. to certain um, solutions all the time. Mm -hmm. So this would mean, from a theistic evolutionary perspective, is that God fine-tuned the universe to eventually bring about human life. Mm -hmm. It's not all random. Yeah. We we're not just got here by we didn't just get here by chance. Sure. The universe was fine-tuned yep. to create life yep. like us eventually. Yep. Yep. So everything I just said is 
perfectly compatible with a yeah. Christian worldview. At what point do you think primates become our modern day context of humans with a soul and what we what we would call consciousness? Well, let, let's define what a soul is. Um, it, the different philosophers will define that differently. Mm -hmm. I think all life is conscious. Okay. To some. Oh, uh, you think like okay. Well, I mean, yes, to some degree, I yeah. guess. I, Cats and dogs are conscious to some degree. Yeah. I would say we're all conscious. So yeah. consciousness just means being self aware. Okay. Or just being aware of your surroundings. You know, you you can you know, that kind of thing. Sure. All life is conscious. Okay. Uh, I would say that we have more intelligence, so we understand our consciousness better than a cat or a dog. Mm -hmm. But I say all life is conscious. Now, what's a soul? Mm -hmm. You're going to define it differently. Uh, how I have defined soul is more in an Aristotelian fashion, okay. uh, not a Platonic fashion. So I don't think it's like this immaterial substance. It's sort of like inside of us. Mm -hmm. I define soul as like your personality, your thoughts, your dreams, your emotions, okay. uh, your goals. Now, you get that. The moment you get a concept, I would say it starts at conception. You start building this identity, mm -hmm. and that evolves and changes over time. Mm -hmm. And then that is what goes on after death, is that soul. So you're a conscious mind with a soul, in my view. Mm -hmm. And we are all consciousness. Now, humans are, have the ability to build much more complex and interesting souls. Mm -hmm. uh, you might call it personality. You might call it an identity. I don't care. I call it a soul. Yeah. And that is what we get, and that is what God builds. It's a soul-building theodicy. Yeah. If you've ever studied philosophy uh, surrounding the problem of evil, you'll see this title, you'll see this phrase, soul-building theodicy. Uh -huh. Same kind of language. Huh. We are slowly built, we are conscious agents, we are conscious minds, yeah. building a soul. I would say all life, to some degree, has con is conscious. Mm -hmm. We have just gotten to the point, we've evolved to the point where we can build complex conscious souls that God can have actual relationships with uh, beyond just, you know, having, you know, like, Pets, like we yeah. have pets, like cats yeah, yeah. and dogs. Would you use the word, when when the New Testament uses the word spirit, I think of Romans 8, where it says, his spirit testifies with our spirit, mm -hmm. that we are, I think, sons of God. You could, you would, could. You, would you interchange spirit and soul? No, depends. Because uh, what do you think this description is saying in terms of our spirit and God's spirit entering us at regeneration? What does that mean? So and, I mean and why and, and why can primates not explore you know, monkeys and apes can't experience that, but we can. Yeah, so spirit is defined differently in the New Testament. Sometimes it's defined more abstract. Sometimes it's defined ontologically. Mm -hmm. So you can define spirit like, uh, you could define like maybe that's our, our actual consciousness, this sort okay. of like immaterial substance. Interesting. Uh, and that could be like our spirit. And then yeah. we build a soul on mm -hmm. top of that spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, the reason why is because, again, primates cannot have the intellectual capacity we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, mm -hmm. The human mind is one of the strangest uh, things in all of the universe, as mm -hmm. far as we know. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like it in terms mm -hmm. of its mental capacity. Yeah. You know, we are really unique in the animal kingdom, for sure. Aren't dolphins pretty smart, too, though? They, they're pretty smart, but they are nowhere near nowhere humans. Near humans. Nowhere. Okay. And so people will say dolphins are smart. We mean they're just smarter than, like, a dog. Got it. Like, okay. you know, think, like, you know, like, you know, dolphins, elephants, you know, they're about the same. Like, humans yeah. are, like vastly yeah, smarter yeah, yeah. in just yeah. every possible way yeah so we have that edge so spirit spirits kind of like our consciousness but also with our soul and our personalities yeah That's you could say it like that. i mean these paul defines these words differently depending on how he's using them like yeah. we do yeah. i could say you're a you're a spirited young fella mm -hmm. you know paul uses it he talks about spiritual gifts he doesn't mean ontological gifts you have mm -hmm. he means more like abstract understanding of things you have yeah uh, so he defines these words differently. Yep, yep. And so we need to make sure we read the context of what Paul is talking about in these passages. Yeah. That's good, man. It's it's a fascinating position that I've kind of stumbled across. I told you I checked out uh, Francis Collins on Unbelievable, mm -hmm. having this conversation and, and kind of explaining his views with theistic evolution. I was just kind of like, man, this is interesting. I've never really, I, I've never really, I've never thought it isn't necessarily compatible. I knew there were Christians out there that held to some form of evolution, mm -hmm. uh, but kind of hearing it unpacked like this, I just go, "Wow, that's 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 pretty cool." You know that that that's a fascinating view of um, of of all of it. And would you say more and more apologists are starting to kind of take the position of theistic evolution? I know William Lane Craig holds to mm -hmm. it. Obviously, we talked about Francis Collins, who's not really an apologist, but he's a you know head of the whatever program he's the head of. Um, Biologos. Yeah. So you, uh, do you see more and more folks who kind of flow in the in the streams that you're a part of taking this position? Yeah, especially young people. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Young Earth creationism is dying. And also, it's not, an, it, you know, it's, it's not necessary. I did a video on the origins of Young Earth creationism, the modern movement. 
And if you study the history of young earth creationism, it basically died out by the 1850s among the, among Christians. Mm -hmm. Well, why are there so many young earth creationists today? Mm -hmm. Well, let's study the history. In the 1850s, so the only major group uh, that called themselves Christians mm -hmm. uh, that held to young earth dogmatically were the Seventh-day Adventists. Mm. This has become their, because their alleged prophetess, Ellen G. White, claimed she had visions that prove that, that God created everything in six days and there was a global flood. So they dogmatically held to that. And mm. then there was a guy named George McReady Price, mm -hmm. who was like an armchair geologist who went out and he was going to prove the earth was young. And so by the 1920s, the anti-evolutionist movement that sprang up was more old earth. Even at the Scopes trial, they mm -hmm. were old earth creationists. They mm -hmm. weren't young earth creationists. This is a big misconception we have. Mm -hmm. By the 1960s, two guys, Henry Morris uh, and John Suckham Jr., took some of George McReady Price's old ideas and recycled them mm. into this book called The Genesis Flood. Mm -hmm. And they admitted this in their letter. They were just taking all of um, Price's old arguments and mm -hmm. reusing them. Mm -hmm. And they spawn, they spawn the Young Earth Creationist movement we have today. And then it, it starts to grow. And there were so many Young Earth Creationists that came out of the 70s and the 80s yeah. that just weren't there in the 20s and the 30s. Mm. And so now we're just slowly starting to overcome that. But the Young Earth Creationist movement, the modern movement, does not trace back to the historical church. That died out by the 1850s yeah. because uh, geologists, scientists of the time, church theologians recognized that Genesis was perfectly compatible with an old earth. This is fine. Yeah. Uh, even, even in the early days of the church, like uh, Clement of Alexandria, St. Athanasius, mm -hmm. Augustine, yeah. uh, a lot of these guys realized that Genesis, they were interpreting Genesis 1 allegorically. Mm. They were saying the days are not actual little... Historical days. The, which which church fathers were saying that? Uh, Saint Athanasius the Great, mm -hmm. uh, Ath, uh, Alexand um, excuse me, not uh, but, Saint Athanasius the Great, Clement of Alexandria, and Augustine. Uh -huh. Church fathers I, I can think of off the top of my wow. head. Wow, yeah. this is big names. They were teaching that the days of Genesis one were metaphorical or allegorical. Hmm. God, they thought God created everything instantly mm -hmm. and then just explained it in the uh, by using days. Gotcha. So they were young earth creationists, but they did not t t take Genesis 1 literally. Mm -hmm. They interpreted it metaphorically or allegorically. Mm -hmm. So by the time you get to modern geology, mm -hmm. historical geology, these types of things, mm -hmm. Christians were like, okay, this is fine because we've already in, we already have a church precedent set mm -hmm. that this does not need to be interpreted yeah. literally. Yeah. And so you get basically young earth creationism die out by the 1850s, and then it gets revived because of seven-day Adventists and Henry Morris and John Wickham Jr. ruining it by recycling these old seven-day Adventist <laughs> yeah. arguments and then telling the church this is the historical view. Interesting. It's not necessarily the historical view. There were many early church fathers that interpreted Genesis 1 metaphorically, allegorically. Yeah, yeah. So what are we worried about here? Yep. We shouldn't be. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Someone's saying, what do you think of the fossils found in Texas with fossils that show footprints of humans alongside dinosaurs? Yeah, they don't. I haven't heard any of this. No, they don't. And there is no scientist that thinks that. Uh, there there have been footprints found that resemble human footprints. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not, though. I mean, scientists, when they get and they evaluate them, mm -hmm. they are you. They don't actually resemble the actual way the humans would step and walk, mm -hmm. pick their feet up and move. They resemble the way... Uh, some sort of like lizard would walk. Mm. And so what happens is they just get meshed and destroyed over time. So people just think that they just appeal to the vagueness of the footprints. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a footprint called the Meister print. Mm -hmm. And it was found and it looks like a boot print. Mm -hmm. And there's a fossilized trilobite on there. Now trilobites go back to, you know, go way, way back before dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So we go, aha, see trilobites. This is proof that humans were living alongside this thing that the evolutionary timeline said was extinct. No, this it just resembles a boot print. It doesn't actually make the right impression for a human to have walked there. Mm -hmm. The stone just happened to be cut out in a certain way that resembles a boot print, but it's not actually a boot print. Mm. And no scientists, experts in geology, paleontology, just have evaluated this and go, there's just no evidence here. And here's their data. They can prove this. Yeah. Interesting. Very cool. All right. Well, I think that's enough uh, theistic evolution <laughs> questions. Um, so in terms of you holding some of these positions, I feel like it kind of primes you to engage in some of these debates, right? I saw your debate with Destiny. Recently, mm -hmm. you you put out a thing, um, and I and I was uh, hoping to get eyeballs on it for you, of uh, going on Rogan. Um, oh, I'd love to go on Joe Rogan. Yeah, Joe Rogan, have me on, please. I would. I, would, I think. I think that would be really fascinating. 
Um, and generally speaking, when you go into these uh, spaces where there's not Christians or you're debating someone that's not a Christian, you seem to be received very well. I saw you on uh, Myth Vision, mm -hmm. uh, obviously the debate with Destiny. Generally speaking, um, is, would you agree that when you go into these spaces, you have these conversations, you're speaking at it from a philosophical standpoint, but you're also able to acknowledge science and all these things that it gives you an edge to um, make a solid, reasonable case for theism and then from theism to Christian theism and ultimately people placing their faith in Jesus. Well, I hope I'm successful in that. Yeah. I want to be, and I keep working at that and trying to improve constantly. Um, I do get along with a lot of atheists. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not hostile. I go after arguments, not people. Yep. I just, I just ignore people that, that resort to insulting me yep. and re resort to this character attack. Yeah. Because those people are not interested in that intellectual conversation. Yeah. Uh, they, 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 they're they just there for clicks and views and they're going to you know use whatever means they can do to get it. Mm -hmm. Anyone who relies on insults is just, I don't, I don't take seriously. And I have scolded Christians, uh, for doing that kind of thing. And I will say, yeah, it's been more in private mm -hmm. because I'm trying to follow the, the steps of scripture, going to somebody and saying, Hey, don't be like this. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, if, if an atheist is polite, we can get along and just disagree. Yeah. So if Joe Rogan wants to have me on, please have me on. I'd be more than happy to come on and present a more intellectual side of Christianity because I'm not a young earth creationist. Yeah. I can talk about the history of Constantine. I can talk about all these issues that he's brought up on his show, and mm -hmm. I'm happy to discuss that with him. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, th I, think that, I think that would be great, and I hope that— because uh, he's had some guys on that are, like, new Christians. Yes. Like and he can running. have me on. We can talk about carnivore diet because I've been trying it lately. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you, you, you like it. I, I actually have, it's been the first diet I've tried that I actually really enjoy. That's awesome. The only thing I've, I've, I've been using dairy as well, but yeah. it, I've actually felt better on you're it like, too. You're like super duper keto right now. Yeah. I mean, you're like, not, you're, you're, you are like, you are like the ancestors. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to just see how my body works with just animal products. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not strict about it. Like I do a little cheating occasionally, yeah. but yeah. I mean, you know, I just want to, I've had stomach issues for a while and this yeah. has actually been helping it. Yeah, that's cool. You, you were telling me that yesterday. I was so interested. I'm doing a, I'm doing a empty your bucket plan with Coach JT, and it's uh, it's more or less like a paleo mm -hmm. keto with veggies, and that's it. No no dairy, no grains, no sugar, no wheat. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, doing it's, carnivore, it's, it's the first time I've ever tried a diet where, I, A, I didn't have food cravings mm -hmm. that were just, like, unbearable. Mm-hmm. I mean, occasionally I crave sugar, but it's like, oh, whatever, I'll just get up some butter later or something. Yeah. And it's the first time I don't get sick of what I'm eating. Mm -hmm. I still want to eat more meat. Yeah. So I'm like... I'm we'll gonna... go get some meat after this. Sounds good. <laughs> we'll go get some meat after this. Um, I want to I wanna, uh, give you an opportunity just to, to tell people how they can support you and how they can partner with you. You mm -hmm. are a nonprofit, <laughs> um, and uh, that means that majority of the stuff, the, the revenue that's coming in to support your ministry is coming in from donors directly. Right. And so obviously outside of the YouTube and the amazing library, I mean, your channel is like a freaking encyclopedia of just mm -hmm. gold and inspiring you. philosophy. Um, how? Uh, what are other ways that people can partner with you? Okay, so yeah, I am a, a registered nonprofit, 501 so also donations to me are tax deductible. 90% of how I stay funded is through personal donations, people like you sending me donations. So... What I'm doing on my channel is I'm building the apologetic video library. Uh, it, these, these are evergreen videos. So people find my channel because they have a crisis of faith. Someone told me about the Council of Nicaea. Someone told me that uh, there are the, there's no archaeological evidence for the Old Testament and the Exodus. And they yeah. go on YouTube frantically and they find my channel and their faith is saved. So I need you to partner. I need people to partner with me to keep making these videos because I'm going to keep adding to those videos constantly uh, to prevent this kind of stuff, to bring more people into the kingdom. Yeah. And I post testimonies as well. So partner with me. Go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash inspiringphilosophy. My website, you can donate inspiringphilosophy.org. I'm on Locals now, so inspiringphilosophy.org, inspiringphilosophy.locals.com. Uh, and people donate, so I keep making these evergreen-type videos. Yeah. And I deal with, like... Little objections, too. Like, I just did a video on Second Kings 3 yeah. uh, because there's people say that in that chapter, God is defeated by some pagan deity. And so yeah. I debunked that because yep. Christians said they were struggling with that. Yep. Yep. Uh, things like that. I've debunked, uh, I got a, oh, I got a playlist on supposed Bible contradictions or supposed mm -hmm. Bible errors that yep. I go through and do yep. that kind of stuff. Yep. I give evidence for the resurrection, evidence for the New Testament, debunking this kind of stuff. Yeah. And so that's what I do. That's how people support me. It's just, most of my donors just donate five, ten bucks a month, something like that. To keep yeah. me going. Yeah, that's good. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to our exclusive Patreon-only segment. I'm going to ask you a few more questions. The number one reason you think people deconvert or deconstruct, I want to ask you the strongest argument for theism and God, if it's the one you used 
with Destiny or not, mm -hmm. which had the simulation in it. It was such a dope argument. And uh, what is the strongest, most linear argument for the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So, hey, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see the full extended version of this podcast, be sure to sign up for our Patreon community for only $5 a month. It'll really help us continue contextualizing the gospel using YouTube, media, and podcasting. And in exchange, you will get full unedited versions of the podcast, of our daily after-party streams, a discount for our merch store, and exclusive access to our private Discord server. It's only $5 a month. The link for Patreon is in the description of this video as well as the pinned comment below. Again, hit the link in the description, sign up now, and I'll see you over there, all right? Peace.